Yes. Oh, he's giving. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> hey, friends. Hi. How's everyone? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for joining us for yeah. our talk at GitOps at Production Scale with Flux. I am Priyanka Ravi. I also go by Pinky. I'm a platform tech advocate at G Research. Yeah, and uh, my name is Lee Kapili, a longtime Flux contributor. Uh, for some reason, I decided to work for a startup called Flux. <laughs> uh, um, Just to confuse us. It's not the same thing, but <laughs> it is open source if you're curious. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna start for those of, uh, like anyone that's new here to Flux. So what is Flux? Flux is a flexible toolkit for you to build your own GitOps platform. You can build your own uh, journey with Flux and it is a foundation for continuous and progressive delivery solutions for Kubernetes. So the idea is you put it in your cluster and you kind of just set it and forget it. And it pulls all of your changes from the cluster um, from your source. Now, why do we care? What's the benefit of that? It honestly reduces developer burden, and the reason I can say that, I feel validated in saying that, is because I was an end user. That's my story with Flux. I worked at a large insurance company, and I helped set up GitOps there, and we chose Flux. So, it's also very extensible, like I mentioned, and Lee's gonna mention it a bit too. You can really change your journey with it, um, and you get to choose and make your own uh, Stuff I'll show you in a second how that works. And it also comes with out of the box support for customize and Helm. And because it's designed for Kubernetes, it's made to just kind of work with all the tools you're already using in Kubernetes, all the popular ones. Mm -hmm. And it's really, um, it's got security at core, at core and Lee's gonna talk about that for a second too. Yeah, just the, the way that we have factored the project from the very beginning when we like Flux used to be this little binary that you would deploy to every single namespace that you wanted to reconcile in your cluster. It was, it was a cute little single Go binary that could hook up to a single Git, Git repository. And when we built Flux 2, the ecosystem was at a state where people were doing all sorts of metaprogramming around how to deploy that single binary of Flux like 50 times in a single cluster. <laughs> we're like, oh, <laughs> there's a bit of a use case here. We gotta build something uh, that can be multi-tenant, that can work with multiple clusters, that can have security at its core. And um, so like working with the team, I was able to write the RFC uh, for, or well, we didn't do RFCs back then, but it was like kind of a, a, a design, a security model. Like an architecture. Um, the, you know, like, uh, St Stefan and, and Philip and stuff got to work kind of breaking out the problem into multiple resources and controllers. Uh, and now we are at a state in Flux where everything is implemented in Go. None of the controllers do any shell executions to arbitrary binaries. And so the entire behavior of the project with all of its complexities and features, uh, all of its mature and correct integrations with Kubernetes API machinery, its leveraging of the Helm SDK, um, it's all just go. There's, there's no weird blobs, there's no throwing the execution context over to some other place with a different security model. There's no place where you have a buffer and you can talk to things. There's no external API talking to Flux, it's just the Kubernetes API. And, and so the security model was like almost the most important part about the design besides making it usable for everybody uh, and making it usable for complex organizations. And um, the result is that when we do a security mm -hmm. audit, of which we've done Multiple, many, yeah. thank you CNCF. <laughs> yeah. uh, CNCF has just been such a great host for the project. Really? But when we do a security audit, you know, they're just like, looks good. <laughs> no you can statically analyze the entire code base and um, all of the behavior is very expected and uh, you get good concurrency and performance. Love. We love what we've built here, so. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the overview of Flux, so I'm just gonna talk about the architecture for a second, because I think it's really important to show how slim this project is. So the Flux is actually made up of a set of Kubernetes controllers and also has 13 CRDs in it as well. And the controllers are as such. So you have the source controller, which is, and one thing I wanna mention is that these are running on a schedule. I'll talk about that in a second too. So the source controller is continuously pulling your source, which could be, a Git repo, it can be an S3 bucket, OCI, it can be anything. Um, well, <laughs> most things. <laughs> um, and it's pulling from the artifacts that it finds there. 
and then it, uh, the customized controller or the Helm controller are the ones that come in and apply them. So don't be confused by the customized controller. It's named so because it is using customize in the back end. Um, and the way that it's doing that is if you have a customization.yaml in your full file path that you set, sh point it to, it will actually just apply what it finds in there. But if it doesn't have any, it'll actually recursively search that file path for any YAMLs, and it'll create a customization YAML on its end that it'll just apply. Um, the Helm controller is really, really neat. Big fan of the Helm controller. It uses the actual true Helm API, so if you're using Flux with Helm, it, you can actually do like a Helm list and see your um, Helm deployments there. And then the notification controller uh, allows you to do inbound and outbound traffic, so one neat thing you can do with it is um, have Git actually have a webhook to tell the source controller, hey, a change has been made. Don't wait, whatever the sync interval is, maybe five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever, go apply it right now. Um, and then, right now. Yeah, right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other so. thing it does is it can notify you yeah. in like Slack, Teams, whatever you're using, um, and tell you, hey, either a change has gone out in production, or hey, maybe go take a look at your Flux instances, something looks a little weird. Um, and that's really cool because one, you actually do want to know usually when your changes have been gone to production, so. So that's like the four kind of core. default core controllers. Come with Bootstrap without right. any optional commands. Mm -hmm. That's what you get. Yeah. That's how lightweight Flux is, really. This is it. This is Flux. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you add an extra command into the Bootstrap command, you get the image reflector and the automation controller, which are the most underrated controllers in my opinion. They're pretty cool. They're so cool. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody uses them. I feel like the people that do use them, they no, use them people, in such cool ways. Use them, yeah. I love it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I wish I had taken more advantage of it. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, so the cool thing with them is that if you have a YAML that references an image, you can set it up to say, hey, if that image goes and gets a new version within this range, go update my YAML and automatically kick off a deployment. Yeah. So it'll write back to Git for you. It's like it's watching your OCI repository for when you push something there, and then like using tagging policies, and it's like, oh, let's write that change back to Git so that everything about the desired state of your repository is static. Uh, and then it funnels back through source controller and goes through yeah. all of your operations. And it, it doesn't just have to be a deployment image tag. Because of the way that we've built it, you can just put a comment in any YAML file, mm -hmm. and the image update automation controller will find that comment and update that line based off of your image policy. It's really cool. <laughs> which means that you can update Helm YAML. You can update, like, like values YAMLs mm -hmm. for Helm. Yeah. You can update Docker Compose files. Yeah. You can update GitHub Actions. You can you can update um, like uh, CR the CRI um, and Node Working Group has like a new volume plugin mm -hmm. where you can specify an OCI image to like mount like AI models and stuff like that, um, and now you can like use an OCI like volume source inside of Kubernetes. You can update that with image update automation controller because we have a generic way uh, to find image references and for you to tag them with policies. So. Super cool controller. It is really cool. You and can do very GitOpsy stuff with this. It's really awesome. Uh, yeah. Try it if you haven't. Uh, so the Flux SDK uh, is made for developers to be able to create their own controllers with Flux. So that's what I meant by it's extensible. And in conjunction with that, there are several that have already been created, including the uh, Tofu controller, the CloudFormation controller, and the Pulumi operator. So if you're not familiar with those, I recommend going and checking them out. They're pretty uh, cool as well. I guess like uh, those would all be like great open source options, and then also there's even like uh, proprietary solutions being yes. built by companies. Like um, yeah. I used to work with VMware, uh, and like their Tap solution like reads directly into source controller APIs, similar to Pulumi. So yeah. yeah, it's extensible not just for open source stuff, but like because we built Flux with the CNCF license, you can build products on it. Um, oh, I guess I'm talking about this next, huh? <laughs> yeah, um, usability. <laughs> so I mean, uh, oh, is that, does that look scary to some people? If you're not using Flux, then maybe. Um, if you are using Flux uh, as an uh, end user because like your SRE installed it for you, uh, this is what's happening under the hood. <laughs> but they probably did something a little bit simpler. Um, they probably just ran the Flux bootstrap command. So we knew that when we factored things out um, into multiple binaries, we were gonna be adding complexity. Um, and even from the beginning, when we were just using a single binary in Flux1 with zero integrations with the Kubernetes API, there was no CRD, you just configured it with flags, uh, people already had a hard time 
getting the SSH keys or um, you know like GitHub pa like access tokens for a repo or like can, you know setting it up in GitLab and and then you got to like go to you make a repo and then push some manifests into it and then configure it and you know. <laughs> And, and then now that you have that, like then you install the thing into the cluster and then you have to make sure that the cluster can also talk, or like the, that Flux can talk to the cluster um, and maybe you actually want it to talk to a different cluster. So instead we wrote Bootstrap. Um, and what Bootstrap does is it helps you juggle the dance of three separate pieces of infrastructure configuration. Uh, and Bootstrap is item potent, mm -hmm. right? So like a lot of times people miss this we because this. it feels like an install command, but when you run Bootstrap with flags on a Kubernetes cluster, you can run it again and again, and you can change the versions uh, of Flux that are being installed. You can change the repo it's pointing to. You can update the Flux command line tool and get a new version of Flux through Bootstrap. Uh, and since you can run that over and over again, uh, it's a great way to, uh, from the very beginning, uh, be very declarative about your GitOps platform. Uh, but then set up your Git repo, do all of the authentication handshake, uh, and make sure that all of the CRDs and stuff are connected up in the right way. Make sure you're on the right version of the Flux CLI. That's, a, that's like a thing, too. If you update the Flux CLI, it'll update the bootstrap. Oh, well, yeah, because uh -huh. yeah. like, it's pointing to I've the done new that bundle. <laughs> yeah, uh, like you probably want to pin it if it's like yeah. in a CI pipeline. Speaking yeah. of CI pipelines, Bootstrap um, has Go libraries. Uh, that you can use yourself. We use them for the Terraform and OpenTofu providers. Um, there's, they've been recently even refactored in the most uh, in the past two GA releases. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, it, it hooks up to your favorite, uh, you know, Git host provider, um, GitHub, GitLab. So if there's no repo there, it'll just make one for you as long as you're authenticated. Yeah. Uh, also. Uh, as far as UX uh, goes, the, our friends at Control Plane have open sourced the Flux operator very recently. Um, go try it out. You can Helm install it from a Terraform apply, uh, and you can just click a button in Operator Hub and install Flux to your clusters. Um, the Flux operator uh, is a way to actually get Flux installed without a Git repo. Nice. And since Flux actually in supports many different source types through Source Controller, you can do git list git ops if you want. So it could be good for like crossing an air gap or something if there's like some, you know, DOD nerds in here <laughs> or whatever. But, but yeah, Flux is usable. Um, and so the community has also produced a bunch of UIs. Uh, this one's been around for a while. Um, it's from the folks at Gimlet. It's called Capacitor. Ha, Flux uh, Capacitor. Uh, very funny. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, you can go into this UI, uh, go find all of the reconciling resources and click buttons to, to send things, uh, you know, cause them to reconcile. Uh, you can sort of see uh, what resources are being controlled by Flux and just get a sense of uh, what the operational state of your cluster is. Um, there's also the newly released headlamp plugin for Flux. The headlamp team has built- Fresh off the press. Yeah, it's right off the <laughs> press new. and it's super good. One it's of really my favorite awesome. features about the headlamp um, UI is that, when you look at a customization or a Helm release uh, or something that's actively reconciling onto the cluster, like say um, a Terraform apply or a Pulumi up mm -hmm. uh, or a CloudFormation template being applied, those kinds of things, that um, you can see the countdown to when it's going to reconcile. Uh, based off of the last reconcile time and the reconcile interval. That's so, new. I haven't seen that before. In any other thing. Yeah, you know, cool. you jump That's into really the cool. web page and you're yeah. like, oh, I just pushed a change and I feel like I made a mistake. When is it going to reconcile? <laughs> Let me go pause it, right? So, yeah. Now, um, just because Flux is uh, usable um, doesn't mean that the extensibility uh, that we built all of these individual interfaces for doesn't scale for you. And that's sort of the heart of this talk. Um, Flux adapts to your organizational structure. You can shape it to the way that you want Flux to behave. And I think this is really important. It, it differentiates Flux from a lot of projects that start out as an existing developer platform at another company uh, or have a product direction. Um, there's a number of GitOps tools that have been um, through the scene at the time. A lot of times people want to know how is Flux different from Argo? Uh, and the projects come from very different places. Uh, Flux is not a platform. Flux is a toolkit for you to build your platform uh, so that you can do things the way that you want to do in a secure way and in a Kubernetes way, native way. Right? So there's no extra APIs or authorization systems in Flux other than the Kubernetes API and the Kubernetes security model, Kubernetes authorization system. Very important difference. Um, and 
Kubernetes is made to fit your organization, so is Flux. So some things that start to cause scale and pain uh, when we're doing continuous delivery on a declarative distributed computer uh, would be things like microservices. Now you've got a ton of uh, teams writing a bunch of different programs in different programming languages that have their own configuration, uh, and now you're breaking them out into multiple Git repositories, so you need to reconcile from a bunch of different Git repos. Uh, but then some Git repos need to reconcile five things, and some Git repos have one thing, and some Git repos have 17 environments of one thing. Uh, and so there's a mismatch, actually, between the sources and the reconcilers. Core to Flux's design is that you have full control of how many sources and how many reconcilers there are. So I can have 10 customizations pointing to six folders in three repositories. Uh, and that's a perfectly valid and sensible thing to do that's within the design. Um, once your, uh, your org is like proliferating all of these services, then you probably have a team called SRE um, that is really curious about uh, what sort of uh, legal agreements you might be able to make with your customers. Uh, and so they're like, hey, I need, like, I need service level indicators, and we gotta make some objectives and turn it into an agreement that a customer can sign, because otherwise we're gonna owe them money. Uh, and so we uh, really built Flux to scale um, to be a multi-region GitOps platform uh, and to be able to deal with the kinds of tenancy needs that you get from organizations who you might even be a little bit secretive within their org. Um, there are security constraints. So I've talked already a lot about tenancy. Uh, we use network isolation to make sure that when sources are being pulled into the cluster, uh, that things that are not supposed to can't get access to the bits that contain potentially sensitive things. Um, we, uh, yeah, like, we have great case studies, like uh, Cisco spoke at Paris KubeCon. Um, you can imagine that Cisco probably needs to be compliant with GDPR. Uh, and so a regional GitOps platform uh, needs to be able to isolate data in that way. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about sharding as well later. Um, and um, yeah, you know, if you're expanding your business, Flux can do it. So let's say the problem statement. Uh, we're like, gosh, how do we build a benchmark and like validate that this is gonna work for people? Um, and now we run this in CI uh, on every Flux release. Uh, say you want to deploy 1,000 workloads on 100 clusters. That's quite the fan out. There's going to be a lot of reconciliation happening there. And because we're doing GitOps, we're doing pull-based continuous delivery, where those, that, that, all that stuff doesn't just happen once. It could be happening every hour or every five minutes even. Uh, that's a lot of traffic to a bunch of Kubernetes API servers. Can, can a single installation of Flux handle this? Uh, yes, let's talk about how to get there. So the scaling strategies are gonna kind of follow in this order, right? This is like sort of where you would start as an operator of the Flux platform, uh, or as a like practitioner. Operator is like this like overloaded word now, because everyone thinks it's a robot, but then like, <laughs> also like I identify as an operator. So. <laughs> um, so we're gonna start first with just making sure that we're not doing any sort of silly things with the way that we're hosting our sources. Uh, again, the sources are the API type that maps Flux to actually getting bits from someplace that can host desired state, right? So those could be S3 buckets, Git repos, OCI repositories, Helm repositories, that kind of thing. Um, and then once we are not doing any silly things with where we are getting our sources from, we can do a little bit of controller fine tuning. We can also make sure that we're using Flux's API model in a way that allows for concurrent, uh, concurrent reconciliation. And when we hit the limits of that, of which the defaults will get you quite far, then we can start looking at vertical scaling. Uh, we can start giving things just more CPU. Uh, and we can maybe start turning some knobs. Uh, we'll talk about those knobs. And finally, when you really get to 10,000 cluster scale. Um, or if you have some interesting performance boundaries uh, or even security boundaries, uh, you can create very isolated portions of a single Flux installation uh, by using horizontal scaling through sharding on label keys. So with that first step, what are the things that we can do just making sure that our architecture has our bits, our sources, our desired state in a way that is performance friendly. We want to first 
get away from a bunch of these kind of deprecated Helm repositories that use HTTP, um, or just like, it's like the raw HTTP repo. It's just, it wasn't built for scale, but it was built uh, in a way that allowed the Helm ecosystem to advance to where it is now. Uh, now the golden standard in Helm is to put charts into the OCI repositories where you store your container images. Uh, so we're putting content into OCI repos that's not just images. Uh, and um, what else was I gonna say about this? Yeah, I mean, basically there's just, there's a lot of incentive, you know, to like keep using the same artifact registry, but if you're hitting a scaling limit, um, moving to OCI uh, is gonna be the answer in a lot of cases for Flux if you are working with lots of desired state. Um, then we wanna think about where we're getting our Git repos from. Uh, if you're fetching your Git repos over the internet uh, and you have lots of bits again, like we're talking, you know, th thousands of clusters scale, yeah. right? Lots of desired state. We're pulling in a bunch of different repos. Um, there, if that connection is flaky or latent, uh, it's gonna make the Git protocol slow. Right? The Git protocol has to do a couple of things to figure out what blobs you need to pull. Um, even just using the Git protocol has an overhead, but if you can co-locate mirrors that are dedicated to your Flux installation, um, you know, then it's like you just have a, we're talking about a single install of Flux reconciling to hundreds of clusters, right? Yeah. Um, and so uh, the, that, that's like a way to make it much more performant uh, is to make sure that the network link is there and that the, the Git repo is not oversubscribed. Um, this one is the next uh, sort of, thing that you can do f from an ergonomic and like kind of programming model perspective, which is splitting the Kubernetes resources that you are reconciling to the cluster into separate flux customizations, mm -hmm. right? In the same way that like we wouldn't put everything into a massive Helm chart. Um, like we, we wouldn't like put like 5,000 resources Hopefully. into a, a Helm <laughs> chart that, yeah. and expect that to work well. Right, um, we wanna be able to reconcile things granularly. There's a lot of benefits to reconciling things granularly. One of the big things is actually security, um, the ability to tune uh, the reconcilers um, schedule, uh, the, be able to, the ability to pause uh, and resume things and poke things uh, at like a particular application level. Uh, and so you should be splitting up your resources, but the main performance benefit here is that all of your resources, when Flux talks to the API server, they actually have to be validated together. Um, and uh, if you have a lot of them, like we have to wait and then we have to all apply them to the API server all at once. Uh, Flux can apply things to API server concurrently. So as long as your API server and Kubernetes can handle it, uh, which is a separate question, uh, then you can you can really boost the, the amount of resources that you can reconcile at once by splitting things out, right? And so just, it's a good practice for, I can think of probably 10 or different, 10 or 15 different reasons. For fine tuning the controllers themselves, we can make two infrastructure modifications here. I think this is, I think this is on the right side, yeah. <laughs> so uh, persistent storage. Um, this is good for a couple of reasons uh, on the source controller. By default, source controller just pulls stuff and then it stores it on its local um, volume. Uh, and that volume is ephemeral, right? It goes away. Uh, but you can turn that uh, into a persistent volume. And now when source controller restarts, when you upgrade Flux, it doesn't have to pull gigabytes of stuff from wherever it needs to get them, OCI, that kind of stuff. Um, and then, um, when we are reconciling, customized controller in particular has to do a lot of file operations, and writing those to disk is kind of slow. Um, and uh, that can be a scaling limit if you're asking customized controller to reconcile many, many resources. So uh, we have examples of patching um, both source controller for the persistent volume and uh, customized controller for putting a tempfs for the place that it writes temporary customized builds to, uh, that it does for like calculating hashes and stuff. Lots of read and write operations that need to happen there. Uh, if you put it in a tempfs, uh, if you don't know what a tempfs is, it's backed by memory. Uh, and now all of the files being written um, through the Linux kernel are just going directly into memory, which makes the uh, library calls from customized controller so much faster. We're still good on time, cool. Um, we've kind of exhausted now laying out our sources properly, 
Um, I guess like the only other recommendation you'll see in the benchmarks later is that OCI is way faster than other protocols. Uh, so like if you run into more scaling limits with Git, you can move everything to OCI. Um, there's some other benefits there too. But um, now we're at the point where we've got our persistent storage, customized controller is really speedy in RAM, um, we have everything factored out, uh, everything is secure and independent and independently controllable, uh, it's all concurrently reconciling, uh, our Git repo is low latency, it's a good place, yeah. right? Yes. Um, let's throw some CPU and RAM at it, right? <laughs> We're now ready to go beyond the defaults. <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, you know, scale it up. And you can start upping the amount of concurrency uh, that like, things like customized controller and Helm controller uh, will do. Uh, so you can, you can start tuning that up. And that's naturally going to create a higher request volume for the Kubernetes API server. Uh, this is where you have to put your SRE hat on. Uh, you're beyond flux and into scaling Kubernetes. Right, uh, making sure that Kubernetes can keep up with all of the serialization. Um, you can also tune back, uh, this is not on the slides, uh, you can tune back your reconciliation intervals. Uh, if you find that you're hitting scaling limits with Flux, um, the, the Go scheduler is constantly creating Go routines that are talking to the API server uh, in things like customized controller and Helm controller, and you can just tell each resource to do things less often. Uh, that's also a great way to <laughs> conserve resources. So, um, We did mention benchmarks. Uh, this is something that runs in CI uh, for our releases. We're excited about this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mean time to production. It's cool. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh, that's not a real DevOps acronym, is it? We, I feel like we made that up. Yeah, I think we did. Yeah. No, uh, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you can see uh, in this table uh, that I'm sure everybody wants to read um, that OCI repos are kind of faster than maybe doing something complicated like using the Helm SDK to, you know, uh, wait on resources and, and stuff uh, and write things to Helm storage. And uh, so it's, it's more complex to reconcile a Helm chart into a Helm release. Uh, than it is to you know, take a bunch of raw manifests and spit them out from an OCI repo um, source. Um, Git is pretty good, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, basically you can do 500 OCI repos in about 45 seconds, uh, 500 customizations uh, in about two minutes and two seconds. Yeah, Helm charts, uh, you know, we're pulling those in from source controller. Uh, so like OCI repo and the Helm chart, those are source controller um, APIs. And then customization and Helm release, those are our reconciler APIs for customiz customized controller and Helm controller. Um, so we're both. this benchmark is testing both fetching things from sources over the network uh, on, a, on a cluster that's running on a 16 uh, core, you know, um, uh, GitHub's actions runner uh, that was donated to the project. And um, the... We're both pulling sources and reconciling them to the Kubernetes API. You know, that's what the benchmark is testing. Um, you can see that, like, even for a thousand Helm releases, uh, which is, you know, I mean, you're you're doing something a little bit complicated here. This is a single flux installation uh, on a 16-core machine. I think you can find a bigger machine even than that <laughs> in AWS if you pay like a couple hundred bucks a month. Um, eight minutes, pretty good. So. That's a, that's a win for sure. Yeah, for sure. Helm controller, uh, it was always good before, yeah. but it wasn't this good. It's so real good now. Hats off to Hita yeah. um, for excellent engineering work. Some of the, uh, some of the most respectable so good. Um, yeah. engineering that I've ever had the privilege. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what? Yeah. Uh, Hita, yeah has, we love them. <laughs> Hita has transformed the Helm yeah. project. And honestly, Helm controller is a complete reinvention like, uh, of the Helm project. I think it's like the basically the next generation interface to declarative Helm. Um, horizontal scaling. Now that we've scaled it up, we can scale it out. Uh, there's also other reasons uh, that you might want to horizontally scale. So each of the controllers in Flux, you can point them to a label key that is sharding.fluxcd.io slash key. Uh, and you can put whatever string in there. Uh, and then when you uh, make an installation of that controller, um, then you can point that controller to that label key and it will only control on these resources. It uses a label filter in the Kubernetes informer. Um, 
you can shard for a couple of different reasons. Here's some examples, right? Like you can shard and say, hey, I want like um, biz apps, you know, to do all of their web apps uh, from these things. And then I want super secret, um, totally doing something ethical portion of the business unit over here, <laughs> you know, to, um, to have their own <laughs> section of reconcilers, right? Um, <laughs> This, this is the maintainer track, I did not right? see that coming in. <laughs> yeah, great. okay. Um, for sharding strategies, like you could do tenancy. Uh, you can also do infrastructure, right? So if there's um, a lot of clusters that you're like wanting to reconcile to, uh, then that would be like applicable for this kind of picture. So we've got um, our source controller pulling from, say, the management repo, uh, and then we also have an applications repo. Uh, that's just normal Flux features. You don't need to horizontally shard for that. Uh, but now we have two instances uh, of shards. And on the apps repo, we want to say customize controller to look at shard one, and then we have another install of customize controller looking to shard two. Uh, and shard two is gonna be our production shard, right? We are going to the US and Europe clusters from that instance of customize controller. Uh, but then for, say, compliance requirements or security or performance, um, like say you just, somebody makes a bad commit <laughs> or something, it gets all the way through your processes somehow, and um, like customized controller is churning on or, or failing validation or something for shard one, uh, you have a completely separate install uh, of that Go binary that is pointing to the staging cluster. Uh, and you can just do this with label separation. Um, we, I think, learned this from the Knative project. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, or at least, like, we talked with yeah, them about yeah. it and we're like, oh, this is working well for you. So we're shout really out to the, sharding, to, the, yeah. to the engineers on the Knative project uh, for sharing API machinery tips for this, with us. Like, I like to say that I wish it existed when I <laughs> had yeah. set that up. I don't know. I guess, <laughs> like, in conclusion, I, I feel like I've been rambling a lot about performance and scalability. Um, there's a lot of things you can do, yep. and it makes it good and then you can you know, have a very snappy GitOps platform. Um, when you see eight minutes for a 1,000 Helm releases, that's on a single GitHub Actions runner. I think if you're running some nicer nodes, you'll get better performance than that by a lot. So. Thanks to GitHub for those yeah. runners, though. <laughs> we do appreciate them. OK, so we're not done. <laughs> Sorry. Let's <laughs> talk about what you know, people that actually are using Flux are excited about. What's new since uh, Stefan did his talk in Paris? And what's coming up mm -hmm. as well? So OK. So the first one that we're very excited about, sorry, the next slide. Oh, no. Here. Yeah, yeah. let's do it. <laughs> um, okay, so some things that we're really excited about is that in um, 2.3, which came out in like quarter two of this year, um, that we promoted to GA the Flux Helm APIs and the Flux Helm functionalities as well. And so uh, also in 2.4, we promoted to GA the S3 compatible storage API, which is the bucket API. and. Um, and uh, it, yeah, <laughs> okay, so the Helm's OCI improvements are something that we're very excited about as well. Um, Flux 2.3 came with this support for Helm releases to refer to OCI repositories as an alternative to Helm releases and Helm charts. And so you get a better UX when debugging Helm releases. It allows you to reuse the same chart between releases. Um, it allows pinning of Helm charts by OCI Digest. You can up automate um, Helm upgrades using Semver ranges scoped to release candidates only and provenance verification with cosine and notary um, notation. So notary notation is the one that we added recently and we're very excited about as well. Okay, so then we have, oh yes, this is something that we're really excited about as well. The Flux Operator um, is an open source project um, developed by Control Plane that offers an alternative to the Flux bootstrap procedure and it removes the operational burden of managing Flux across fleets of clusters by fully automating the installation, configuration, and upgrade of the Flux cluster controllers based on a declarative API. And so it really uh, simplifies the configuration of Flux multi-tenancy lockdown, sharding, horizontal, and vertical scaling, which we talked about, persistent storage, and it allows for fine-tuning of the Flux controllers with customized patches as well. Some of the other things uh, as well is that uh, uh, Stefan is using the Flux operator as a base to do some higher level um, like coordination across mm -hmm. GitOps repos. So you could maybe do some interesting um, stage rollouts and stuff yeah. like that at this layer. Yeah. Uh. Okay, so we've also done some uh, improvements to our Terraform provider. 
And uh, so it's gone and it's undergone a major refactoring that now supports air gap bootstraps, which is really exciting, drift detection and correction for flux components and the ability to upgrade and restore the flux controllers in cluster. So this is starting, um, so starting with this release, the provider is fully compatible with open tofu as well. And you can uh, check out more about that um, in our documentation and there's full instructions. Uh, okay, so also we have Azure DevOps OIDC authentication and we would really like to give a big thanks to Microsoft, sorry, I'm running out of time. So we'd like to give a big thanks to Microsoft for helping us with this feature. Um, please look into this as well. Um, and then also, this is something that we're looking forward to next year. It's the GitHub app OIDC authentication. It's a work in progress and it will be released um, early next year along with uh, the primary goal of V2.5, which is releasing in Q1, is um, to make all of the Flux image automation APIs uh, generally available. 2.5. Yeah, we're really, yeah. Can Flux you believe GA 2.5. Yeah, here. we're going to, and the image automation stuff. Yeah. yeah. We're yeah. trying to make a GA. We're really so, excited. Um, this is like kind of our closing thing yeah, here. Just please come get involved with Flux. Um, we have an RFC process uh, for new features that you can take a look at. Uh, and we enable community members to take full ownership of the Flux uh, features that they want to add. Um, if you're interested, please go check out our project repo. And yeah, come chat with us. We love it. Oh, also we're on uh, hashtag Flux in the CNCF channel. Too. And I think that QR is FluxCDIO slash KubeCon. Yeah, so that has all of our like, you know, like Flux happenings this week. Yeah. Most of them already happened, but you can check us out at the booth. We're really yeah. excited to talk to y'all. Please come chat with us. Thank you, Thank friends. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, this is yours.